Welcome to our look at Unfair, a theme park building game with some nasty elements. A big thank you to Good Games Publishing for providing us with a review copy of this game. Unfair was designed by Joel Finch, who also did the graphic design. It features development by Kim Brebbett and Kate Finch, and artwork from Nicole Castles, Lena Cassette, Dave Forrest, and Philippe Poirier. Game was originally funded on Kickstarter and published in 2017 by Good Games Publishing and Simon, now just published by Good Games Publishing. Unfair has an MSRP of $49.99 US dollars. Now, a game of Unfair can be played with two to five players, with Board Game Geek users recommending four as the best player count, and I can't say I disagree with that. Now, a game of Unfair takes an hour or two, depending on the player count, the amount of AP, analysis paralysis, and which game changer cards you choose to use. And the game changers are only one of the great ways that this game has a huge replayability factor. Now, in Unfair, players take on the role of competing theme park owners, each trying to build the most successful theme park. You'll combine decks featuring cool park themes like pirate, robot, gangster, and vampire to make each game unique. Players will add attractions to their parks and improve on them with upgrades while trying to get their parks to conform to the specifics of high-scoring blueprints. Remember, though, this is unfair, and it's not all fun and games. You'll have to deal with unfair city events like wear and tear that can close your rides, and your competitors being nasty by doing things like paying off the safety inspectors to shut down parts of your park or hiring hooligans to vandalize your best rides. Note, if you are looking into this game for the first time, I strongly suggest you pause and instead check out Funfair, also mm -hmm. from Good Games Publishing. Despite being released after Unfair, Funfair is a great gateway game to this card-based park building system. It's shorter, easier to learn, and a more family-friendly game that removes all of the take that and nastiness from the game. You can check out our Funfair review on the blog, on YouTube, or as part of episode 120, Engine Building. Now, getting back to Unfair, for a look at what you get in the box for this somewhat nasty theme park building game, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, I go into a lot more detail in the components of this game over on the blog review. For this show, though, I'm just going to say I was impressed by most of what you got here, almost everything. There's one of the best written rule books I've ever read that makes learning the game a breeze. There are lots of cards that are good quality, already split into the various theme decks. Anyone who has unboxed a copy of any of the legendary games knows what I'm talking about here for the other side of things. Nice thick cardboard token, surprisingly thick, featuring the best design money I've seen in a board game that isn't metal. There's even a two-sided board made to work for if everyone's sitting on the same time at the table or on opposite sides, which I thought was a neat bonus, and some amazing reference material and player aids, not only including large rule summaries and icon references, but also cards that you can also use to take up even less room, summarizing the end game scoring as well. Big thumbs up for these summaries and player ability or player tools. There's even a box insert included designed to hold sleeve cards for those of you who care. Now, the quality on this is top notch. It actually exceeded my expectations. My only complaint about all this, though, is there's no real place to put all the tokens, the cardboard stuff, the money, the first player token, the mesmerism tokens and other stuff that comes in the game, the randomizers. Now, there are baggies included, which is great, but there's no real spot to put this stuff in the insert. Now, there is a trough in the middle, but it won't fit all the coins, for example. For now, it works because the spots for cards, there are is four empty spots at this point. So that's great. I can just bag that stuff and throw it in the empty spots. But I know the first expansion for this game has four more decks, and I would want to put those decks into those spots. And I honestly have no idea how I'm going to fit everything into one box because of that. If all the card slots are filled with cards, where do all these tokens go? Yeah, unfortunately, that seems to be a real problem in games. I know I was talking about it with a game I, uh, I discussed uh, the other night where, you know, everyone puts thinks about the cards and thinks about the miniatures and the map tiles, but all the little bits kind of get forgotten yeah. about. No, I totally agree. Now, another thing of note 
is my copy of this game obviously wasn't the first printing because it included a small pack of replacement cards. Now, this is something I do appreciate good games publishing for doing. With every new printing of Funfair they or, and Unfair, sorry, or every new printing of Unfair, they've updated this pack of cards, fixing some minor issues. My pack happened to note that it was the second pack. This just fixes balance issues and things people complained about or things they found editing issues. Now, we're not reviewing it here today, but I did notice the expansion included the exact same pack of reports, replacement cards. So if you did get like a first printing of Unfair, if you buy the expansion, you'll get this. It's not like you need to rush out. And I am sure if you contact Good Games Publishing, there's a way to just get these cards somehow. I didn't look into it myself. All right. Well, now that we have a good idea of the stuff you get in the box, how do we use all of these cards and tokens? So the first step in playing a game of Unfair is deciding which theme deck to use. Each game requires the use of one deck per player. Now, in the base game, there are six different theme decks. You have Gangster, Ninja, Vampire, Robot, Jungle, and Pirate. Now, the rulebook does include some suggestions on which decks to use for your first few games, and I fully agree with them. The decks are not all equal as far as learning how to play or difficult to use. Now, to help you pick, each of these themed decks includes a reference card at the start of it, indicating any special rules changes required when using it, as well as this little rating system going from one to five over four different elements. Uh, attraction size, blueprints, coins, and unfairness. So if you really like building tall rides, there's, you probably want, in particular, you want probably the, uh, the jungle deck or the pirate deck. If you're all about collecting coins, you kind of want the gangster deck and so on. Now, to be interested, to be clear you don't have to just play so if you if you add the the gangster deck and someone else adds the vampire deck and someone else adds the robot deck you're not mm -hmm. just trying to build a specifically gangster theme park yes you're mixing and matching all of these to try and come up with the best park overall mm -hmm. from the available decks yeah this is more similar to the the board game smash up uh it's where you're taking two decks and you're going to smash them together. But instead of everyone picking their own deck, you're picking the decks that are in play for that game. So even though you picked robots, you, you're not playing the robot deck. It's just one of the decks that's used. Now, what you are going to do when you do each have your own deck is you're going to combine them all. The way you do this is you sort them by their card backs. They did a great job on designing this so everything's a different color. You're going to mix and shuffle all the cards of the same backs together. You're then going to build the city deck. This is going to feature four funfair city cards and four unfair city cards. Each player also is going to get two random showcase cards and five random park cards. All the other decks are just shuffled and placed on the board face down. There is a market that is in play. I think it's a six card market. I could be wrong. It might be eight. Sorry, I should have checked that. Uh, you're going to put a bunch of face up cards from the park deck into that market. And I have to say this game is deceptively simple to play. One thing that should be noted is you really do need to make sure that everyone's paying attention to turn order. And, mm -hmm. and making sure that all the steps are followed. Now, luckily, they do have those reference cards, so it's not hard for someone to keep that. But if you do get playing quickly, we have noticed that it is easy to sometimes yeah. do something a little bit out of order. And unfortunately, depending on what decks are in play, that can matter. Yes, the timing can be important. Once I get into the, a description or overview of play, I'll, I'll explain all the different steps, but it is easy to forget them, especially the first three steps of the game. Things can end up out of order. Now, the next thing you're going to do, you've got picked your decks, you're ready to play, is you have to decide if you want to use a game changer. Game changers are a small deck of cards that come with the game that each can significantly change the way your upcoming game of unpair plays. Now, the rule book and I suggest you start with the first date game changer. Use that for your first game. What that has you do is remove two unfair city cards from the bottom of the city deck, making the game shorter and less nasty. Remove the showcase cards altogether so you don't have to worry about them. And then remove all difficult and insane level blueprint cards. Don't even worry about those. Now, other game changer cards include really cool things like the World Peace Game Changer where you can't use event or park abilities to affect other players. This is great for groups who dig the game, but don't like to take that aspects. There's even the school vacation game changer that makes unfair a kid's game. It removes everything but the park cards and changes the game to be a race to see who can build five rides with at least 15 stars on it. Now, notably, the expansions also add game changers mm -hmm. as well. 
And there are also other promo game changers uh, out there in the world to collect as well, if you'd like. And for those of you who don't want to go shopping around for that, there is a full card list on uh, Good Games Publishing website. and You can just read the game changers off there. Now, for the rest of this overview, though, I'm just going to assume you're not using game changers. We're going to take them out and I'm going to teach the base game. Just realize that some of these things may have been changed by using one of those game changers. Now, the last thing you're going to do now that you've got everything decided is everyone's going to take 20 coins from the bank. They're going to place their main gate card in front of them. And that is your first card in your tableau. That represents your, 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 your thing just opened and it's a gate. <laughs> That's it. Now, a game of unfair is played over eight rounds, which are broken into a number of phases, as we mentioned earlier. Now, every round starts with all players drawing an event card. Nope, they just draw it at this point. Draw it, read it, see what it does, but you don't get to use it yet. Then you're going to draw a city card from the city deck. Now, I mentioned this already, but the first half of the game, these are fun fair city cards. They're all happy things. They're all beneficial. They're all good things. You get extra money. You get to play extra cards. When you draft cards, you get bonuses. It, it, it's all great stuff to help you get building your part. The second half of the game, though, these switch over to unfair city cards that can be devastating with their effects. They can just ruin your parks. Now, another aspect of the game is the round you swap between funfair to unfair, four rounds in a standard game. You also end up closing the blueprint market. And there's actually a card there that's put in the deck to remind you to do this. More about blueprints in a little bit. So it's really interesting how, while this game is cutthroat, and from turn one, you can start attacking and, and, and working against your other players, but the actual game itself starts off trying to help you and build yep. you up before it too starts trying to beat you down. Yes. Now, after resolving that city card, everyone gets a chance to play event cards. Now, each event card split into two options, top and bottom. Now, in general, there are exceptions. The top is something that'll benefit you, whereas the bottom is something you can do to your opponents. Now, each of these adversarial cards have an attack type. So it'll say it's an intrusion or it's a, I can't remember the types off my head. Now, interestingly, some of the events also include ways to block these various attack types. Now, these defensive cards can also be used to block some of those nasty, unfair city events as well. So there is a reason to hold on to these possibly. Now, this is more than I can cover here. There are a ton of events in the game each with different varieties and themes and each different theme deck has its own events. I, like there's no way I can cover them all. They just do all kinds of things. Um, some of the effects include earning extra guests or money, letting you upgrade your stuff cheaply, recovering cards from the discard pile, drawing additional cards and nasty things like closing your opponent's attractions or destroying their upgrades. There's also a few cards that let you take additional turns. And to be fair, because of these event cards that you get every turn, ha having defensive natures on them, if you would prefer to play a less attack and, and less take that game, you do have the option in many cases, and again, this is, is dependent on what comes up and what you're dealt, but you can hold on to a bunch of defensive cards and try mm -hmm. and just fend off other people while you're playing your own game. So even if you're stuck at a table with some real take that killers you can you can sort of hold your own depending on how you play those event cards now players continue to play events you play event you play event you play event and then until until everyone passes in order no if you do pass and someone else plays an event you can jump back in in addition to the event cards there are some part cards that will have events on them as well especially your showcase cards but we'll get into those in a little bit because next we move on to the park phase this is the meat of the game. This is where players are going to be building their parks. Now, the park phase is broken into four park steps, and each player is going to get to take one action and then move to the next player, the next player, the next player, until you get back to you, and then you move into the next step. Now, every round, everyone's going to get to do three of these. You're going to take three park steps for sure. There is a fourth park step, but that's only available after players play specific events. And I think one of the showcase cards can also give you extra actions. But in general, everyone's going to take three actions, one action at a time. Maybe someone will get a fourth. Now, each park step, you've got a few choices. The first is take. Draw two cards from one of the decks and keep one. That could be the event deck, the park deck, or the blueprint deck. Or discard a park card to draw five. 
Now, I've already talked about event cards. I don't think I have to cover those in your hand. Again, they do go into your hand. They count for the hand limit at the end of the turn. Park cards are, are the majority of the game. These are what you use to build your park, and they feature attractions, upgrades, and resources. Now, each card is going to have a cost on it. It's going to list if it's worth any victory points at the end of the game, and it's going to show a star value, which could be nothing. The star value of the cards in your park determine how exciting your park is and how many vests will come visit it, which in turn will generate you some income. Now, attractions and upgrades also have a number of icons on them, showing whether it's a thrill ride or it's a leisure ride or if it's a feature upgrade or if it's a, a park upgrade. You're going to get points at the end of the game by adding up the total number of icons on each of your attractions, including all of the upgrades on them. And it's fun to as well to sort of talk about things as you're building them. So mm -hmm. I'm building the gangster uh, old olden days themed car ride with a jungle twist and, uh, you know, bathrooms and a coat check. Yep. <laughs> no, you cannot put air conditioning on a thrill ride. That's one of the rules in the game. Now, blueprint cards. I mentioned these a couple of times. These are all about end game scoring. Each card lists a basic park requirement on it. These include things like having specific types of attractions or having attractions with specific types of upgrades or having all your attractions at a specific size, etc. Now, in addition, some of the blueprints also have a bonus section. Now, this bonus section can only be scored if you complete the top, if you complete the, the basic requirement. At the end of the game, you're going to get points for all your completed basics and any bonuses that match your park but you'll lose 10 points per card if you weren't at least able to complete the basic requirement. Now, each blueprint does lift a difficulty rating on it, and it's based on how hard the requirement should be to complete. And it's strongly suggested to not take a blueprint, even if it says easy, if you don't at least have the attraction types needed to complete it, either in your park or in your hand. And I got to I point this out to everyone who plays and someone who's a new player always messes this up. It says easy, though. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's only easy if you had the theater to start with, for example. Now, again, remember, halfway through the game, the blueprint deck does close. Now, interestingly, you won't get to buy blueprints with this take action, but you can still earn them through events and park cards. Now, interestingly, this is the one part of the game that does seriously benefit from system mastery. Mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of players recommend is having or near you or knowing a, the card list available, because there's a good chance that if, even if you do have one of the cards to start with, you may not be able to complete that depending yeah. on what other players have already played or have in their hands. Yes. The next potential action you could be taking on your park step is to build something. Pay the cost shown on a card and put it in your tableau. Interestingly, this card can come from your hand or direct from the market. Attractions are your rides type of things or your, your, your showcases, your hotels, the things people come to your park to see. They go to the right of your gate and you can have a maximum of five of them in your park total. The other types of cards are staff and resources. They go to the left, and there's no limit to how many staff or resources you can have. Now, upgrades are placed onto attractions. Now, some of these cards are also going to have effects when you build them, including the ability to draft cards from the market, build additional cards, or sometimes get a discount on something. In general, though, no attraction can have more than one copy of a specific upgrade. You can't have comfortable seating twice. Uh, an exception to this are the quality upgrades you can have multiples of. And that should be noted because I've messed that one up a number of times. Think always assuming that you can't put them on there because nothing else you can duplicate on your rides. As far as I know, the, the quality ones do clearly state on the card that you can have multiple of them. Right. They're the only ones I remember noticing, but there may be more than quality upgrades. So I don't want to say definitively it's only quality upgrades. There's a lot of cards out there. <laughs> yes. Now, in addition to this, once per game, you have the option to build one of your showcase cards. These are super expensive attraction cards that have super powerful asymmetric abilities and a high star count. So they're great for getting guests to your park. Now, you can't build one of these until your park has at least five stars from other stuff already. So there's no play in one of these the first round of the game. Now, at any time, you also have the option going, forget it. I'm not going to build either of these showcases, remove them from the game, and earn 10 bucks, 10 coins. And that can be big. 
Now, speaking of money, if at any time you don't have enough money to pay for something, you can always take out a loan. Doesn't cost you an action, doesn't take a turn. Each loan you take instantly gives you five coins for whatever you need it for. But that's going to cost you 10 victory points at the end of the game. Each player can take out a maximum of four loans in a single game. Uh, interestingly, these can make a huge difference. If you are lucky enough to get a card combination that means you do not have to take loans, uh, it can massively swing the mm -hmm. game because generally speaking, you do have to take a loan at some point during the game. Yeah. Uh, it's expected, but there are certain combinations that will allow you to avoid that. And that can really, really allow you to step for a step up. There's also the opposite side of that, where I have seen a player take four, four loans the second turn of the game to get their showcase and to play three rounds before anyone else and losing 40 points and the game meant nothing compared to the ability to print money for the rest of the game yep. in, a, in a specific game we played with the gangster theme now another option is demolishing uh remove a card from your part now you might want to do this for a couple reasons like to fulfill a specific blueprint or you might have put down like a low scoring attraction without much on it and you want to replace it with a bigger one. Or when using the expansion, you might want to try to complete a panorama. If you remove an attraction, though, all of the upgrades on it are lost. So most times you're either going to remove an empty one or you're just going to remove uh, specific upgrades that you no longer want. Now, another option is loose change. I think this one's hilarious thematically. Uh, this represents you scrounging around your park looking for chains that fell out of people's pockets on your rides. Mechanically, get one coin per open attraction you have. Because someone always forgets to check their pockets before getting on your coaster. Mm -hmm. Now, play continues with every player completing one park step action until all park steps are complete. Then you enter the guest phase. This is kind of an upkeep phase. Here, players add up the star value of all the cards in their park, skipping over anything that's closed. Now, each park can hold 15 people, which I think represents 15,000 people or something. It doesn't matter. It's abstract. Now, certain park cards can improve that. But in general, your park capacity is 15. You're going to collect income based on your total star value, but it's capped by that capacity. So even if you have 20 star value of an attractions and upgrades, you're still only going to earn 15 income if you're at the basic park size. This takes a bit for some people to catch. Now, players will also receive additional money for what are called tickets. Some of the park cards have this little ticket symbol on them, and it's a way to earn additional money. There's a number of these in each deck, including things like costume characters, photographers, face painting booths, and so on. Uh, there's the casino and the gambler deck where you roll 2d6 and get that much money. Now, this ticket income note is on top of what you earn for the stars. Absolutely. And again, this is one of those things where if you if it sets up right, you can avoid those loans and go all in mm. really uh, well on money or someone else has got them and you're in the in hawk for uh, a few yes. victory points. Now, the final phase of each round is the cleanup phase. Uh, this is pretty simple. Clear the market, replace it with new cards, pinned events go away. So events that were in play for the whole turn go away. Uh, if your, any of your rides were closed, you get to open them by flipping the cards back over. Uh, you're then going to discount down to five cards if you have more than five. And that includes just park and event cards. Things like your showcase and your blueprints don't count. Then the start player moves to the next person clockwise. Now, the game continues until that city deck runs out in a standard game eight rounds. At this point, there is end game scoring. Now, while the game does include a score pad and even a pencil with an eraser on it, I strongly recommend just leaving that in the box or maybe making room to put the coins in the middle and just grab the unfair scoring app. Uh, this was created by the publisher and is great for doing all the math for you. But better than that, more importantly to me, is it also tracks what factions got played and how that affected the game. And the, like the total score, all the players got, how many players are on what factions were in play. This is the data that Good Games Publishing uses to update and modify cards in order to keep the game balanced as they add more factions to the game. It's actually really quite interesting how involved Good Games Publishing is with this game. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, another living game in very many ways. Uh, and it is certainly worth going if you are a player of the game or even interested in playing the game checking out unfair-game.com mm -hmm. uh where you can even find print and play to give that yes. game a try yep 
Now, during scoring, you're awarded points for a few different things. I'm not going to go into full details here, but first is your attraction size. You're going to count up the icons. The more icons you have, the more points you have. Pretty simple. And it does ramp up. So, like, uh, going from 2 to 3 is not as big as going from 13 to 14, for example. You're then going to score all your blueprint points, cards, again, getting points for the completed ones and losing points for the incomplete ones. Importantly, and this is something missed by a lot of players, is you get one point for every two coins you have at the end of the game. This can swing the game. If someone might, their park might look mediocre, but if they've been raking in money all the time, they could take the game just from that. Note, this does happen after the last guest step. So you are going to get your last round's income before you get these points. Next, you're going to get points for any cards on your tableau that have victory points on them. Most of these tend to be staff cards, but there are some part cards that have some end game scoring and some interesting showcases like that do stuff like bury cards under them for end game scoring. Finally, you lose points for those loans you took. Wah, wah. The players play with most points, the Euro game. Ties, I want to get into because I like these. Ties are broken by having the most blueprints. Then the most coins. Then I dig this. Then it goes to who is wearing the most unfair merch. I like that. Like that's just smart thinking right there. Good games publishing. And then the final tiebreaker being a game of rock, paper, scissors. Being unfair, there are no friendly ties. You got to figure out who wins at some point. There was a great uh, uh, meme going around Twitter the other day where at the Olympics, the two greatest athletes in the world will share a gold medal. But if you and I tie in a board game, it's all going. It's all. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no one likes ties. You all share a victory. <laughs> now that we've got a good idea of how to play, let's move on to our thoughts on Unfair from Good Games Publishing. All right. So first off, I'm a little disappointed. I didn't get into this game when it came out. Like there was buzz. It sounded neat. But it, I don't know. Building a theme park sounds kind of cool. I, I, I just I, I kind of wish I jumped in in 2017. That would have been neat. But I kind of am glad I didn't because I got to play Fun Fair first. I really like Fun Fair. You can check out my review. I, it was a pretty glowing review. I don't even know if I had anything bad to say about it. It was, oh, the, the insert was terrible. Like there was no way to organize the car. I remember that now. It's easy to learn. It's quick, a ton of fun. This was the perfect introduction to this set of card collecting tableau building mechanics that are basically the same in Unfair. Like unfair is very similar to fun fair. You've got all of the same gameplay elements that we loved in fun fair, but more. And I'm not just talking about the fact it's nasty and there's punitive city cards and take that elements. There's just more going on in unfair than there was in fun fair. Yeah. I have to say, I really enjoyed fun fair. It was a, a fun game, <laughs> mm -hmm. but having played unfair, uh, while I enjoy the fact that I learned through fun fair, I have mm -hmm. no interest in playing Funfair again. Uh, I like Unfair, uh, and it is, it's one of those take that games that I, it breaks the rule. I like <laughs> this game, again, because there are so many options that also include defensive options. Yes. So that if you are worried and uh, about things, you can plan to minimize or try and minimize the take that aspect. Yep. Uh, or just go all in and, you know, leave yourself wide open by attacking everyone else. Yeah. And just for people who may be watching this as our first ever review, Sean does not generally like take that game. Games would take that elements at all. He would much rather like he's all for competitive games, but the take that stab you in the back generally is a turn off right from the start. Yeah. So one of the things that's totally new and unfair is the events. There are no events in Funfair. There's nothing like it. And I got to say, it sounds simple. Like draw an event card, play an event card. There's a lot more to it than that. This system adds a lot of the depth to the game. For one, this is another resource you have to manage. And it's something else you have to worry about. But even when drawing cards, both games are games where you never have enough cards. You never have enough stuff in your hand. And now I can draw more cards, but now I might also want to draw an event. And then you get to see some of the huge ones, like double the number of people who visit your park this turn. You're like, oh, but it's also a card I could use to close this. And do I use it to benefit me or do I hurt you or do I save it so you can't hurt me later? Oh, it's just such a, a great decision space added to the game through those event cards. Yeah. One of the things about Unfair is while it is a take that game, it's not a uh, willful destruction game. It's not a go out and beat on the other player game, because if you do that, 
you have now left yourself completely vulnerable yeah. to being destroyed by because those event cards are both the attack and the defend. Mm -hmm. So if you just go full on attack, you may well be in trouble <laughs> when yep. uh, as the turns progress. Now, the other area that increases the depth here is the money, the whole money system. So in Funfair, there's a whole system where like outside investors want you to build your showcase and give you money. No, no, none of that here. Uh, what you've got here are the loans. Uh, the, the loans are a huge part of the game. So you can take a loan anytime, but at a significant end game penalty. And the fact that you even have two showcases is awesome. I can build one or this one or neither just to get 10 bucks. And then there's the, the more themes, right? There, there's six different themes and six different decks, with more things in them. Um, the variability of the different city cards, the fact there are fun, fair city cards and unfair city cards. Uh, the complexity of the blueprints is higher. Uh, it's now an eight round game instead of a six round game. Like all of this just makes for a longer, more complex game. Yes. Now, whereas Funfair is a light family weight game, all fun about building a park, this is a significantly heavier game that in my opinion is in the higher end of what i would consider a medium weight euro game like edging towards that heavy like if you add it if you add all the complexity of all the decks i almost wonder if it steps up but the actual gameplay is not difficult yeah so uh for bgg weights you're looking at a 2.13 for funfair while you jump up to a 2.72 for unfair so you've yeah. crossed over that 2.5 mark which is always yeah, which our, is our medium our dividing, yeah. uh, dividing line there uh, and realistically, I mean, you're looking at almost the difference between a two and a three, two and a three at that point. Yeah. Once you once you start ignoring the the fluffiness mm -hmm. in the math. Now, what I dig is that everything I loved about Funfair is still there. That's awesome. Like I, I have that same game experience here in a different box with more to it. And that's awesome. As someone who prefers heavier games, I love all the added complexity and decision points. There's more to think about. There's more options every turn. And that's great for me and the people I usually play with. I like the longer game length. I dig the event system. I love the hard decision of deciding whether or not to take a loan. Or more so in my case, I love tempting my opponents to take as many loans as they can. Well, what do you mean you can't afford that? You just got to take out a loan. Come on. I dig how each of the different theme decks brings a different feel to the game. Now, what I chose not to focus on here is what we thought of each of the six decks, but I have played with each of them at least two times each as well as multiple different combinations. And they're all fun in their own way. And they all change the game. I, I dig how they interact with each other. And man, some of them get even more powerful when combined with others. Like if you're looking for coins and quality upgrades, throw the jungle and the pirate deck together. If you're really looking to kind of stay on the down low and do your own thing, get that gangster deck in play because it's got some unique cards in, right? Like I dig the different feels. Yeah, there's such a such a variety between the things. Like I still haven't played Ninja yet, but I know Ninja is oh, a really nasty take that. <laughs> a really wow. nasty uh deck that that when it when it comes out there. Whereas, you know, your jungle and your gangster, while gangster sounds really take that, it actually has some nice defensive aspects as yeah. in it. Yeah. The the wad of cash card is so useful from that deck. Now, another aspect I love about both these fair games is the fact something sean mentioned earlier while you're playing the game there's there's almost a storytelling experience now maybe that's because i tend to play it with people who are also role players um but it's always been an aspect of every game i play like maybe yes physically i added the ninja theme card and i tucked it under my tiger experience leisure ride but what i'm telling the other players at the time is well you know my park's mostly owned by gangsters right so what the trick is there aren't tigers there's no tigers on this ride at all we just charge people to go on the ride and tell them they're rare ninja tigers they're impossible to spot and every time we ride the ride some dupe gets off going oh i saw a tiger and then some kids like well i saw two and that just keeps them coming those are the kind of stories i love telling in a game of unfair there's a sucker born every minute yes <laughs> Now, one of the other things I love finding in a board game is the feeling of building something. Games that feature this leave me feeling satisfied with my accomplishment at the end of the game, regardless if it came in first or last place. Now, we just talked about this in our tapestry review earlier today, and that's something that ties these two games together for me. This is another game that has that effect, similar to, say, Terraforming Mars. Unfair has that. I built a park. Look at it. Isn't it awesome? Who cares who won? And yes, Funfair had that, but I find it more rewarding. It's even more so in Unfair. 
Absolutely. Now this leaves us with the elephant pen in the theme park, the take that part of this game, the nastiness. This is by far the most controversial aspect of Unfair and something people disliked enough that Good Games Publishing decided to make a more friendly version of the game and created Funfair. There are enough people out there asking for it. They made a different game to make it more friendly. Now, for me, I don't mind some take that. And I actually have no problem at all with the negative effects from that city deck that impacts everyone. To me, that's perfectly fine. I don't, I don't mind the game beating me up. But the take that matcher in this game is a bit much. Um, some of the things you can do to each other are just nasty. Many of the event cards feature devastating effects that if you don't defend against them, can ruin your strategy, your long-time strategy. And that's where it can be extremely frustrating when you have been working for five turns to get this difficult blueprint done, just to have that taken away from you with nothing you can do about it. That can be extremely frustrating. Yeah. So interestingly, one thing I would definitely recommend to players is again, checking out their website is one of the things they actually offer on their website is a strategy guide. And now this is actually something that's beneficial to both teachers of the game and players of the game. Because they talk at the beginning of that strategy guide about customizing the game for your friends, for your table, and how to sort of think about the game for your table versus just, you know, throwing Mm -hmm. it out there. So, again, you've got these game changers that allow you to balance and shift things for your table. But then they also get into strategy both uh, overall through the game and for individual decks to help Mm -hmm. you learn a little bit more about how to balance things so that you're not that one schmuck who doesn't know anything about the game and is just getting pounded on by vampires and ninjas left and right. Yeah, very fair points. Going back to the first time I played it, so the first time we broke out Unfair, we played Funfair, loved it. We played it multiple times. Big fan of Funfair. We pull out Unfair, it's just Deanna and I. It was a date night. Um, We're playing, and I, I, it went terrible. Like, the Deanna had saved up two events for the last two rounds of the game, hit me with both of them one turn after another that undid all of the work I did for the entire game. Everything I had worked towards was taken away with nothing I could do. My whole goal was to complete these two difficult blueprints that would have got me over 60 points by the end of the game. At that point, I was like, I don't like this game at all. Like that, that wasn't fun. Like I did all this work. I built this thing just to have it taken away with nothing I could do. Thankfully, I was willing to give the game another chance. While I still would say, don't play this game on date night due to potential hard feelings. That that can still happen. You don't, you know, it's a date night. You're supposed to cuddle after. And I'm like, I want nothing to do with you. Ruin my part. You don't want that to happen. I have learned there are many ways to mitigate that nastiness. And Sean's already mentioned a few of them earlier in the show and as we've been going. And a lot of them has to do with that system mastery and learning the card decks, which could come from the website or could come from just knowing the cards. Like knowing... The two cards Deanna used to destroy me are in the deck when those two themes in play that is in my head now. Every time I play the game, if I know those two themes are in play, I know that that might happen so I can plan for it. This could be to keep defensive cards. It could be to build contingencies. It could be to make sure to hold on a card that lets me rearrange stuff, whatever it happens to be. I also learned... Uh, the, the hard lesson of diversify your blueprints. Make sure you got a couple of sure things instead of just going for the two big long shots and planning your entire strategy on that. Knowing what nastiness is out there can help you prepare for it. If not, outright prevent it. And that is the big part of enjoying unfair. Like what I actually suggest, uh, you could do it on the website, but before you start playing is pass the decks around. Like everyone pick the decks, look through everyone's different deck and look through each of the decks. So, you know, what, get a heads up on what's coming and you will note there are repetitions. Like the same events are in not like, it's not like the events in the pirate deck are completely unique. And the ones in the gangster are completely unique. There probably are some unique events, but like, you're going to start seeing the same ones. You're like, yeah, yeah, I know that one. I know that one. I know that one. You might want to look through each of the decks first and possibly more importantly, You may want to see how many of each card are in the deck because then you know that rushing for that blueprint that requires you to have a card chase with a gangster scene on it is completely impossible because there's only two in the decks and both are already in play. Not knowing that, you might be spending your entire game cycling through a deck to find something that's not there. Yeah, there's there's a really good reason that one of the features you find in the files list for BGIG for Unfair 
is various people coming up with card lists and yep. why there is a card list on the unfair mm -hmm. game website. Having a card list isn't cheating. It's kind of recommended. Yeah. <laughs> now, besides learning the cards, right? Using a card list, there is an even easier way to get rid of this nastiness. And those are the game changer cards. I don't get people's aversion to using these. Like these aren't house rules. This isn't cheating. This isn't stuff people made up at home. These are official rule variants the designer felt were important to include because they recognize the game won't appeal to everyone. Don't be afraid to use these game changers. They could be the key for making unfair a good game or even a frustrating game to a great game for your personal game group. They also work great for making the game accessible to less experienced players, including even kids, and be able to make things more difficult for experienced players. Like if you've got a group of heavy gamers that like long-term strategy, throw in the advanced planning game changer. What happens with that is everyone gets five blueprints at the start of the game and gets to pick one to keep. So right from turn one, you have something to work towards. If you love money coming in and being able to build all kinds of things, and you want asymmetry right from the start. You want to have a special power and feel, feel different from everyone else. Use the grand opening game changer. Player to your left picks one of your showcases, starts in play, built for free. The other thing that may not be obvious, and I figure it's probably worth mentioning, is you can mix and match these. You can throw down both of those. You can have the grand opening game changer and the, uh, the blueprint one, which may make those blueprints that require you to have a specific showcase more useful. Because I got to admit, those ones kind of frustrate me. I, I have to say, uh, if, you, if you glance at the reviews on Unfair, there's a huge swing in there. And what I notice is the majority of those one, two, and three ratings have only ever played the game once. Yeah. They don't understand. I hated it playing they, it once. They don't understand the game. This game can never be a good one and done game. Uh, you are going to, someone who's going to walk away from a, from their first play of this, disappointed. Uh, someone, if they, if, they, if they crush the other players, may love the game after their first play. But everyone else may hate it. And, and that's because there are, again, so many options with the game changers and things that really mm -hmm. shift how this feels and, and can adjust the game for your table and your preferences. Yes. So overall, I still think fun fair. I'm going to continue to use it. I know Sean said he won't play it anymore, but you know what? It's going to be great for introducing new players to this system. It's actually going to be great for casual game nights, for going out. Uh, we're at easy mode locally here in where people tend to have a couple adult beverages while they're playing. I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to keep around for that. Though I have grown to enjoy unfair more. Again, I hated the first game. Like I had a negative experience my first play. But I've learned that most of the nastiness in this game can be mitigated through, honestly, good play, like proper play. Or just remove it. If you don't like that, use those game changers. I love the feeling of accomplish it I get at the end of every game. Looking at the park I build. I enjoy the stories that get told at the table. Me and Deanna competing over who had the best uh, tiger thing was hilarious the one game where we just kept trying to out upgrade one ride for no point reason just because we were telling a good story i also greatly appreciate the dials on this game i love the fact that i can adjust it to make it more appealing when playing with different groups ranging from quick games to my kids to cutthroat games with heavy gamers i really do dig this game i think there's a lot of fun to be had even at the unfair and this is all without any of the expansions that exist or are already announced So if you're an experienced gamer who digs engine building board games, especially card driven ones, I strongly suggest checking out Unfair. Now, again, if you're an experienced gamer, you can probably even jump right to this and skip over Funfair. Now, if you played Funfair and enjoy it and are kind of like, oh, I wish there was a bit more going on, do it, buy it, pick up Unfair. It's well worth it. Now, even if you don't like to take that, if you're like, oh, I love Funfair, I want more, but I don't want to take that realize that there are those dials. There are the cards you can do and there are things that can make the game more similar to Funfair and basically turn it into Funfair with more options. Now for everyone else, I'd say don't pick this up. As I mentioned earlier, seek out and try Funfair first. It really is 
a better gateway to this card driven park building system that good games publishing has established here it is a ton of fun on its own again i own both games i fully expect both to hit the table for years to come now fun fair is going to come out at public play and casual game events whereas unfair is going to be my game of choice for playing with regulars and my game group are here at home and again if you are playing unfair Remember that it is not that game that you should judge off your very first play. Mm -hmm. Give it a couple of tries. There are so many options. You cannot, you just cannot fairly judge this game on a single play. Now, finally, unlike many games out there on the market, if you do want to try Funfair or Unfair, you don't have to buy the game. You don't even have to go find a friend that's got a copy or go to a local game store with a demo copy. You can get a print and play version of both games online completely free. Or you can play them online through heavily scripted tabletop simulator mods. Yes, I know tabletop simulator is not free, but you can wait for it to be on sale and it's about 10 bucks. Split that with your game group and then you don't have to worry about not being able to play in person anymore. Well, I will say tabletop simulator is not going to teach you how to play the game. It's just a tool that's there. You need someone who have read the rules and knows what they're doing. It is a great digital implementation of both games. And it does the scoring for you. Yes. Well, that's it for our look at Unfair from Good Games Publishing. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com.